I've had some um, pretty strange friends over the years, if I'm honest, uh, some very strange indeed, and I can't recall exactly which one of my strange friends came up with this particular suggestion for a great practical joke. Um, but I remember somebody saying to me once, wouldn't it be great if you could take a newborn baby and, um, and put in their eyes contact lenses that switched everything, reversed everything, so that everything they see from the very first days of their life is completely upside down. Wouldn't that be hilarious? And, um, and, and it gets better. Even um, So they go through life, they have to learn to navigate in a world where everything is upside down. And then on their 21st birthday, what you could then do is tell them that they're wearing contact lenses and take them out. And then they'd have to get used to it all over again, but the other way around. Wouldn't that be a great joke? Obviously, that would be a messed up joke. Um, who, who would be messed up? So messed up that they think that's, that they would th even think of that um, suggestion. Um, you have to be incredibly uh, messed up to contemplate something like this. But the claim that is made in our New Testament reading today, in 2 Corinthians, is that a trick, uh, even more messed up than that, has been played on our whole world. That somebody has been monkeying with our sight. There's widespread vision impairment and it's so tragic and so perverse and so cruel that Paul can only conclude it's some kind of malicious and cruel trick or joke. The vision trick that he's referring to is not uh, one that turns everything upside down exactly. It's more like a great darkening. It's more like some kind of dimmer switch has been applied to reality so that our ability to see the world clearly and accurately is badly diminished. We can't see clearly. We can't see truly. Uh, we're living in the dark. This, uh, for the Apostle, is some kind of trick or enchantment, or you might say a spell. Who is the sick puppy who would do something like that to the whole world? Well, Paul identifies him in verse 4 as the God of this world. It's the God of this world who has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Note, this is God with a small g. This is a God, not the God. This is a being in no way equal to the God who's revealed in Jesus Christ and known by the Spirit. But for now, this being that he's referring to is one with considerable freedom to cause mischief and harm and unhappiness in our world by messing with our sight. His spell, this great darkening, touches all areas of life, but most seriously for Paul is when it comes to the question of the identity of Jesus of Nazareth. Because this issue is like the, the light switch. If you reach that switch, you can reverse the spell. You can see reality as it truly is. The question of who Jesus is, is for Paul the question that, depending upon your answer, will either keep you living in the dark or will flood your life with light. For Paul, the gospel the story of the saving acts of God in Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, this is the key to seeing rightly and to living well in the world that he's made. Seeing the true identity of Jesus Christ is for the Apostle Paul the cure for the blindness that has blighted our world. In verse 4, he speaks about this gospel in really interesting terms. He speaks of the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. It's an interesting des description of what the gospel is. Sometimes we hear people speak of the gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection, or the gospel of forgiveness of sins, or maybe the gospel of eternal life, or the gospel of justification, or something like that. But Paul here, at least, chooses to describe it as the gospel of the glory of Christ. It's really interesting. The gospel, the news that he believes the world needs to hear and that he's dedicated his life to sharing with the world is news about how glorious Christ is. It's not overly controversial to say that God is glorious. That's a kind of a staple, I guess, of Jewish belief. In many ways, it's, it's fairly self-evident. But Paul is saying that this eternal quality of God, his glory, is seen in a human being, in Jesus Christ. The gospel is for Paul, in this 
particular passage of scripture, the radiance of the invisible God, the creator of all, his brightness, his beauty, his wonder, his majesty, his mystery, that is his glory, being poured into humanity, in particular, beginning with and even emerging from this particular man, Jesus Christ. If the gospel is the gospel of the glory of Christ, then for the Apostle Paul, if you deny that Christ is glorious, if you do not see the glory that emanates from this life, if you reject the notion that God's glory shines in Jesus of Nazareth, you have no gospel. You have no good news. The message that saves is a message you can't hear. That's one of the reasons it's so important for us as Christians to remind ourselves, as we do, as we will later on in our service in the Creed, of the full identity of Jesus. That he is more than just a remarkable man. He's more than just an unusually charismatic leader. He is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. He is of one being with the Father. He is the expression of God's glory. Many onlookers uh, watching Jesus from the sidelines as he went about his earthly ministry would have been blind to this. In his earthly life, his, this vision of his glory wasn't something that was fully visible or fully known to people around about him. It was only, I think, uh, widely appreciated after the events of Easter. In hindsight, as people reflected back onto his ministry. But of course, there was one moment which is the exception to that rule. We read about it in our Gospel reading, this moment of the transfiguration. Where just a small number of Jesus' disciples saw in a particularly vivid form, just for a few moments, what Paul calls the light of the Gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They see briefly the, the true and the full identity of Jesus. Yes, Jesus is a carpenter. Yes, Jesus is a rabbi. Yes, he's a healer. Yes, he's a teacher. But in this moment, they see him to be more than all of those things. They see him as the source of pure glory. And of course, that can mean only one thing, ultimately. That his identity, his full identity, includes a divine identity. For the Apostle Paul, writing a few years later, everyone who believes in this Jesus encounters that same reality that was glimpsed on that day. All who recognise in Jesus the brightness and glory of God are bathed in the same brightness that's seen, that was seen on that mountain, the light that lightens everything, that makes sense of our world, that helps us to live wisely, that turns the darkened rooms we often feel like we're living in into open spaces flooded with light where we can see clearly. It all sounds great, doesn't it? it sounds neat. There's darkness on one side and there's light on the other. There's unbelievers on one side and there's us believers on the other. It's all very neat. For very few people, though, is that what their experience as a Christian actually feels like. There are some stories that you hear of people who have lived in darkness and then there's a blinding flash and they live from that moment on in the light of Christ in a really wonderful, dramatic way and we give thanks to God for those stories. But for most of us, it just feels different. The difference between darkness and light is not always completely clear cut. We can't always tell the moment when it happens and even after it happens, we often feel like there are periods where we're still in the dark. We come to faith in Jesus, but we find that we still have doubt. We find that there's plenty of darkness mixed in with the light somehow. We enter into the, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, and yet we still get sick. Uh, we still face calamities of different kinds. We have broken relationships. Our lives are not all together. There is plenty of evidence that our lives do not radiate the glory of God as we wish they did. And I'm quite confident that if we were to ask Paul, he would agree that the spell that he says here blinds the minds of unbelievers is not completely broken even in the minds of believers. But coming into the light, recognising that Jesus is God's unique saving presence in the world, doesn't instantly and doesn't completely dispel the darkness. Often the Christian life is 
like a person trying desperately to stay awake, trying to remain in the light of Christ, but we're just fighting sleep, fighting this sleep that's bearing down, dragging us under. We often feel ourselves sinking under this spell and finding ourselves living just like everybody else, as if God has not done something remarkable in the world through Jesus Christ. And we need to be jolted awake again and again. In his letter that we read from, the Apostle Paul is making, I think, this point, that that glory is very real. It is very real. It's the most real thing there is. But for now, it is often far from visible in our lives. This letter, from, this letter of 2 Corinthians is written in the midst of a very, very painful breach in his relationship with the church in Corinth, the church that he founded and which has now turned on him. It's very possible that as he's writing this, he is in a state of serious depression. He's possibly even experiencing an emotional breakdown. Only a few years earlier, he'd written another letter to the church in Corinth and it's a letter that is powerful and it's clear and it's logical and it's authoritative. This letter is different. His language is more tortured. Often his arguments are less clear. He wears his anxiety on his sleeve. It's clear that something has happened. We don't know the details exactly, but we know that it's a very deep, deeply painful and traumatic relationship that the Apostle is writing into. Paul feels the pain very deeply of the rejection that he's experiencing. But what is clear, what we don't know about the scenario, what we do know is that Paul is certainly very, very aware in these words of the frailty of the humanity in which Christ's light now shines. The treasure of the light of Christ, he says, is carried around in verse 7, in clay jars, that is, very imperfect, very vulnerable and fragile people. Paul has learned over the years quite a bit about human vulnerability. It's been taught to him by civil magistrates who keep locking him in prison, angry mobs who want to tear him apart, his former religious network that has him on their watch list, and even now within the church that he has founded, his ministry being undermined, he knows his own emotional state is incredibly fragile. He's like a clay jar. He could shatter at any moment. The problem that we face is that the glory of Christ, though it is the most real thing in this world, doesn't translate neatly into the glory of his followers. What is most obvious for now in our bodies is not Jesus' glory very often, but Jesus' death. In verses 10 and 11 and 12, Paul speaks again and again of the death of Jesus that he's carrying around with him. Make no mistake, Paul is not confused about this. He is convinced that this will eventually turn to life. Just as Jesus was vindicated after his death, so too his followers will share in his resurrection. But this will not be the result of a natural or inevitable or gradual process of overcoming obstacles or claiming a victorious life. It will be a transformation that when it happens will be no less a miracle than the creation of the world out of nothing. As a matter of fact, the, tra the transformation we are looking forward to is an act of creation, a new creation. God's creation has been broken. It's in darkness but it will be transformed into a new creation. And we believe that this creation has already begun in the resurrection of Jesus. And it's now sprouting in different places, particularly in our hearts. The creation of God, which said, let there be lights, uh, let there be light, is reenacted in human hearts, says Paul in verse 6, whenever the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. There is a new creation coming. The problem for now is that it overlaps very much with the old creation. There is a period of time in which darkness and light exist together. 
This is uncomfortable for us because we have to live in that reality. And it's especially uncomfortable for those who like neat solutions and instant results or easy answers. One of the most horrible things that can happen in a church is that somehow or other, despite all of the warnings in Scripture, we can create this expectation, this cultural expectation, that when you join us, your life will more or less instantly become a nice, shiny thing. And you can join this community of equally beautiful, shiny people. Now, different churches have different versions of this particular error. There's the moral righteousness version. You have a checkered past. Your life is not quite together. Well, you better keep that quiet or find a different community. Or there's the, uh, the faith healer version. Christ will heal your imperfections. He will make you healthy and wealthy. Just claim it in his name. Or there's just the, the middle class version. This is probably the Anglican version, if we're honest. You have the wrong haircut. You've got too many tattoos. Maybe smoke. Um, there's also the, uh, the Bible as a how-to manual for life version. Here is a clear set of rules to guide your life. If you follow these rules, things will work out. If things aren't working out, it's because you didn't follow the rules. There's also the lapsed Christian version. The church has let me down. Christians are jerks just like everybody else. Their God can't be real. We probably are jerks. That's the point. None of these versions of, uh, none of these particular distortions are really grappling with the Christian life as it is presented in the New Testament. The way the Christian life is presented in the New Testament is warts and all, it's complicated. We are imperfect. There are two ages in history that overlap and we're in the middle of it. The new creation's there in our hearts, but it's not always easy to spot. The gospel of Jesus is infinitely precious, but it's carried around in clay jars that are very broken and very brittle. If your life is not together, you are not disqualified. If you have doubts, you are not disqualified. If you have secrets, areas in your life that are absolutely not radiating the life of Christ, well, it may be very serious. It may be part of your journey that Jesus' um, light needs to shine on particularly, but you are not disqualified. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ is not, in the first instance, a story about how you can get together, how you can be together, how your life can be squared away. In fact, the transformation we are looking forward to is what takes us from the reality that we're in to a more glorious reality. The story of the gospel is a story that's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's about his glory. It's about his identity. His identity is the place where the old creation and the new creation come together, where divinity and humanity come together. It's about the destiny to which he will, he will call broken clay jars and make something beautiful. It's a story about him before it's about us. And it's a story about the future before it's about our present messy lives. And it's good news for sinners. It's good news for the sick. It's good news for the depressed. It's good news for those who have failed. Transfiguration is a moment that shows us the light of Christ. And it's a light that shines in your heart as you look to Jesus. And it's a light that will carry you into the brightness and the glory of a new creation, which we long for.